My name is Gerard Vaughan. I'm the director of the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne. And I'm visiting Perth and the Art Gallery of Western Australia to give a talk um, on one aspect of the Princely Treasures exhibition. And I've just had the pleasure of going through the exhibition and I've enjoyed it enormously. What I think we're getting through the collections of the Great Victoria and Albert Museum in London is a snapshot, essentially of two centuries of princely patronage and collecting and taste. And that taste is being reflected in paintings, in furniture, in sculpture and very elaborate decorative arts works, including ecclesiastical works. And what we're really doing, if I can use art historical terminology, we're moving from the moment of the Baroque, that extravagant movement in the 17th century with the great masters Bernini, there's a wonderful sculpture by Bernini and Al Gardi, uh, where gesture and extravagance is everything, through to the Rococo in France in the mid 18th century, which is a refined version of the Baroque, and then eventually the reaction to it, the rise of neoclassical taste and the fact that suddenly artists and designers and patrons look back to ancient Greece and Rome and to a more austere um, and classical form of art. And that's really the point at which the exhibition ends. So what we've got is a snapshot of 200 years of taste and art in Europe um, in the 17th and 18th centuries. There are many questions that one can ask about the content of an exhibition like this. Why would you bring great Baroque works of art from the 17th century to Western Australia, which is a very modern, cosmopolitan, um, multicultural kind of city? But I think that's what museums and galleries of art are for. They're to hold memories of culture and the past. They're to um, present for the public great works of art from the past, and through that to inform in many ways our idea of the present. Because if you think about it, through history, so many artists reference the art of the past in making contemporary works. And even here in Western Australia, the next gallery to where I'm standing has an exhibition of recent work by indigenous artists from Western Australia. But these are very modern works, they're very strident in their colour, and yet the ideas, the themes underlining them go back through tens of thousands of years. The dream time, the great mythologies of, of, of creation um, of the indigenous peoples of, of Western Australia. So there's always this connection with the past and that, that's really for me what museums and galleries are all about. My main reason for coming to Perth and being here today is to give a talk for the members group of the Art Gallery of Western Australia and it's a lecture I've wanted to give for a long time. I gave a version of it at the Getty Museum in California a couple of years ago and it's called Sex, Lies and Theft in late 18th century Europe, the underbelly of the taste for the antique. And what it's about is this obsession at the end of the 18th century with collecting Greek and Roman antiquities, with everything modern, whether it's furniture or buildings, whatever it might be, reflecting the art of ancient Greece and Rome. And this is seen as, an, as a noble form of art, um, a very austere form of art that really reflects the great values of the past. But the research I've been doing through a lifetime, really, I've read so many letters and so many diaries. I've, I've made connections and there was a seething world of, of, of criminality um, behind it all. And it's the old story with everything in life, um, you know, where, where it's about supply and demand. And where the demand outstrips the supply, people are going to step in and make forgeries. They're going, to, they're going to actually supply the market with what the market wants, even if the originals aren't available. So there was a whole uh, industry in making forged antiquities in the 18th century. There was an industry in smuggling works of art out of Rome, because even in the 18th century there were export regulations. You could not take great works of art out um, under the noses of the papal authorities, but people did. So the, there was a whole um, process of smuggling and of course, the, the whole sexual thing is interesting because this was the moment when um, Pompeii and Herculaneum were being uncovered. And for the first time, modern Europeans were seeing all those frescoes in Pompeii of pornographic images. And, and the, the overt, the, the very overt and relaxed way in which the Romans represented sexual activity. And they were beginning to understand that in ancient Rome, the sort of the anxiety that early Christians had about sexual activity was not, a, not, not part of the thinking. That the, um, the, the libido, if I can call it that, um, was regarded as a very healthy and proper thing and a very central part of life. And there were fertility cults in ancient Rome um, where there were these 
um, am these phallic amulets um, that nobody really understood. They were digging them up out of Pompeii and Herculaneum and wondering what these objects were. They thought they were a hoot, of course, the young British men on their grand tour. They thought these were hilariously funny. But gradually they began to realize that these were related to antique fertility cults, where people would actually go into a temple um, and there were certain gods, the god Priapus, for example, um, who was always represented in antiquity with a full erection. Um, and this was shocking and, and remains perhaps shocking to us today, but in ancient Rome, this was regarded as perfectly normal. Um, this was the god you went to um, if you wanted happy sex lives um, and many children. Um, and this was all being understood gradually through the 18th century. So there's a, there's a whole sort of issue there about bad behavior, um, theft, smuggling, all these things going on under the surface. But the end result was this rather austere um, classicism that comes down to us today. So it's just an interesting story. The 18th century was rediscovering the ideas of the past um, and what, we, what they had had before the discoveries of, of Herculaneum and Pompeii were the texts of antiquity and some of them were very sexually overt of course and, and ribald and risque. Um, you know, think of Catullus, for example, the Roman poet, Pet Petra lots of them, in fact, sort of, you know, wrote in a very sexually extrovert way. But for the first time, the actual imagery was being uncovered. And so um, scholars, and not just scholars, ordinary people were able to put the two things together. And gradually they worked out um, what the Romans thought about the whole issue of sexuality in relation to everyday life, if I can put it like that. The idea of the V&A goes back to the middle of the 19th century, in fact, to the Great Exhibition of 1851. And that was about modern manufacturing and designers and people in the middle of the 19th century who exhibited in London for the first time in this massive building all the best products of art and design and manufacturing known in the middle of the 19th century. But many of the artists represented the art of the past. So you've got the Victorians love the Renaissance, for example, so you would get contemporary mid-19th century artists referencing um, art produced in Italy in the 16th and 17th centuries. When the Great Exhibition was over, they still had all this amazing material, so Queen Victoria and Prince Albert decided that there should be a permanent museum in London to deal with all of this, and they set up what was called the South Kensington Museum, which was later renamed after Queen Victoria and Prince Albert the, the, the Victoria and Albert Museum, the good old V&A that we all know and love. And gradually, as time went on, not only did they have modern works of art that referenced the past, but they began to collect the actual works of art of the past. So they began to collect Renaissance treasures, um, s silver work and, and, and gold work of the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries. And ever since, the collections of the V&A have grown and grown and grown. And it is one of the great collections um, of the world. And it's, all, it's everything. Well, I mean, one of the things about the V&A was that things didn't have to be original. So, because it was a place for, for artists and artisans and people training to be designers, it was a place for them to come in London to be inspired in making their own work. And so the V&A had this amazing program in the 19th century to go all over the world, but particularly to Italy, and to make casts in plaster of all the greatest works of art in Italy. So not just casts of Roman sculptures, but casts of great Renaissance sculptures, all the great Renaissance masters of, of Italy, Donatello, Ghiberti, um, the great golden doors of Florence Cathedral. The Brits, with all that money and ambition in the 19th century, they sent a team to Florence and they made a plaster cast of the, 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 the doors of the Florence Baptistry, which you can see today in the v &A. So you, you didn't just get original works of art, you got facsimiles of things that could never be owned by the v &A. So if you can't own it, you have a copy of it. So it's a great, it's a great compilation, but the, the real reason for doing it was not just for the general public to enjoy seeing it, it was to be a useful resource for training artists and designers and artisans. And that's very much the Victorian concept, I think. And when the National Gallery of Victoria was established in 1861, we are the oldest public art museum in Australia, we were modelled on what was then called the South Kensington Museum. So we were meant to be a little mini v &A in the colonies, in fact. That's how we started. It's quite interesting, that trajectory. So we encounter in the exhibition this amazing Baroque portrait of King Charles II of England by a French sculptor, and this is one of the most extravagant Baroque portraits I have ever seen in my life. It stopped me in my tracks, I have to say, uh, when I encountered it in the exhibition. Um, but of course, 
he, his taste was very French because his mother was a French princess, um, Henrietta Maria, the wife of King Charles I. And after the Civil War, the family went into exile in France. So he was very much a part of the modern sort of French style of the Baroque. So that's the style that was reflected in the English court um, after the restoration of King Charles II. And then, of course, there is a Benini, um, a wonderful portrait by Benini, again, very extravagant Baroque style, produced in Rome by an agent of King Charles I, whose job it was to take a portrait of King Charles I by the great Van Dyck to Rome to give it to Benini, so Benini, using the portrait, could sculpt a marble bust of the King of England. So you've got all these sort of interconnections which are really fascinating. Again, there are two very beautiful um, paintings, one painting and one sculpture, which are juxtaposed, again at the beginning of the exhibition. One is of Madame de Pompadour, the principal mistress of uh, Louis XV of France, who dominated the French art world and was the powerful figure in offering patronage to artists, to sculptors and to painters. And there's a wonderful portrait of, a very important one, by Boucher, the great artist. We actually have, in the collection of the NGV in Melbourne, a pastel of Madame de Pompadour by Boucher. But this is a very beautiful painting. So one of the great, powerful women of the 18th century who was a patron of the arts. And right beside her is the marble bust of the other great, powerful woman of the 18th century, the greatest patron of the arts, in fact, um, Catherine the Great of Russia. Um, it's by Shubin, um, a, a Russian sculptor. And it's very beautiful because most portraits of Catherine the Great of Russia show her as the austere empress. This is very personal and has her smiling and looking even slightly um, fragile, which is not a word you would associate with Catherine of Russia, I have to say. She was a tough cookie and she got what she wanted and she brought all the great artists and thinkers of Europe into St. Petersburg for the glory of her court. And I'm going to be talking about her in my um, lecture tonight at the Art Gallery of, New South we of Western Australia um, by arguing that she, was, she too was involved in smuggling and dirty dealings. And some of the things that came into the Russian imperial collection in, at the end of the 18th century were never paid for. And I believe the Empress was behind it. Um, so there are a lot of interesting things going on here. So as I said, when you go through even the Hermitage in St. Petersburg and see all these great things, a good number of them, in my view, were stolen um, and never paid for. So there are all these different stories um, about works of art of this kind. But I think to have, together, um, Boucher's fabulous portrait of Madame de Pompadour and Catherine the Great, the two women of the 18th century who were the greatest patrons of the arts. And that, that's a great thing to have in Perth, I think.